webinar. During the next hour, we will learn if there is any connect between diabetes and latent TB infection, as well as how diabetes links with active tuberculosis disease, drug-resistant tuberculosis, and tobacco smoking, for instance. World Diabetes Day is on 14th November 2017, as we all know. It is important that we do not ignore these connections or linkages between diseases because we cannot control diseases in silos. Integrated responses and collaborative activities between sectors is essential to improve program outcomes across the board. We cannot deliver on any one of the 17 sustainable development goals and ignore the remaining goals and targets. We need to progress on all 17 of them for a better tomorrow. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsarup. Ashok Ramsarup is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was senior producer at the South African Broadcasting Corporation or SABC, as it is more commonly known as. Over to you, Ashok. Um, greetings from Durban, South Africa. Welcome to this exciting webinar where we will learn one of the key scientific highlights of the 48th Union World Conference on Lung Health held in Guadalajara, Mexico. First ever population-based study was conducted to learn if any link was there between diabetes and latent TB infection. Today, in this webinar, we have the key scientists behind the study and other panelists who will share more how two diseases, TB and diabetes, interconnect, and also how the risk factor of tobacco use jeopardize both. As we know, latent TB is when the TB bacteria is in our body, but does not cause any disease and is also not infectious. One third of the world's population is estimated to have latent TB infection. In some people, this latent TB gets converted into active TB disease, which can be infectious. If TB of the lungs and also needs early and accurate diagnosis and proper treatment and cure. We have distinguished experts on our webinar panel today. Dr. Leonardo Martinez, postdoctoral research fellow from the, from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Stanford in the United States of America, who presented the outcomes of the study, promising results for an investigation of glycemic control and prevalence of latent tuberculosis infection, LTBI, population-based study. Dr. Anil Kapoor, Chairman of Board of Directors, World Diabetes Foundation, and Dr. Surya Kant, National President, Indian Chess Society, and Professor and Head of Respiratory Medicine Department, King George's Medical University, KGMU India. Before we learn the scientific highlights from our panelists, let me request you all to keep sending us your question, either by using the chat function or raising virtual hand of the webinar too. Keep sending the questions while panelists present. Now, let us listen to one of the key scientists behind the first ever population-based study on latent TB infection and diabetes, Dr. Leonardo Martinez from Stanford University of Medicine in the USA. It's over to you, doctor. Thank you. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, going to... Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, my name's uh, Leonardo Martinez, and I'm going to present um, some data that I presented at the Union Conference in Guadalajara on um, tuberculosis infection and uh, glycemic control and um, its relationship with diabetes. 
So there have been many studies in the past that have um, looked at diabetes and tuberculosis disease. And these have shown that those um, uh, people with diabetes have a high risk um, to develop tuberculosis disease in the future. And those um, with diabetes, but especially those with poor diabetic control, may be those that are especially vulnerable for tuberculosis. And so this is really important um, for tuberculosis control because um, there are many, uh, diabetes is increasing, especially um, in low income settings um, and also in other areas that have high, um, uh, high numbers of um, population, such as China, such as India, and, and also other areas um, in Africa where diabetes is also increasing. So very quickly, uh, there are three stages of tuberculosis. There's a healthy stage um, where people have no infection or disease. Um, and then those people can um, develop tuberculosis infection, which as was said is asymptomatic and not infectious. And that's the stage that I'm gonna be focusing on um, for the outcome of the study that I'm gonna be presenting. And then there's a, you can progress from infection to disease and um, that is a stage, um, usually it's in a pulmonary stage, it's the most common, um, pulmonary is the most common form of, to, of disease, and it's an infectious stage. And most studies with diabetes have, have looked at tuberculosis disease. Um, and so that's, that's something a little bit different about this study, it's, it's more about infection. So there, there have not been any population-based studies that have looked at the relationship between diabetes and tuberculosis infection. And so we wanted to um, look at this relationship more. We also wanted to look at whether glycemic control or uh, control of diabetes um, modified this relationship between diabetes and tuberculosis infection and whether those that had poor diabetic control were especially at risk. Or tuberculosis infection. So um, first we investigated where diabetics were at increased risk for tuberculosis infection in a large population-based observational cohort. And then um, secondly, we examined whether glycemic or diabetic control modified this relationship. And you can see on the right, um, a, a tuberculin skin test is one of the measurements for uh, tuberculosis infection. And that's the, that's the measurement that we used um, in this study. So we use data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in the United States. And this is a representative sample of the non-institutionalized civilian population in the United States. Um, there is one study visit um, that includes standardized questionnaires, biological samples, and physical examinations. And um, this, this study is, is not just for diabetes and tuberculosis infection, but is um, used to measure a range of diseases. Um, and the process of the study, participants are given tuberculin skin tests to measure tuberculosis infection. And they're, um, they're also administered hemoglobin A1C tests. Um, a random sample of these participants are also administered a fasting plasma glucose test and a two-hour plasma glucose test for a diabetes diagnosis. So in this population, um, we included 4,215 participants, um, 20 years old or older, and the range, uh, the demographic range for diabetes was there was 13.2% of the sample were diabetic, 33.7% uh, were pre-diabetic, and almost 2,000 participants were, uh, so 53% of the sample were non-diabetic. Uh, there were 16.3% foreign-born and almost 20% were smokers. And overall, the prevalence of tuberculosis infection in the entire sample was around 5%. So relatively low, um, the U.S. Is a, is a fairly low tuberculosis burden um, country. And so, yeah, so that's why 5% is, is maybe a little lower than some other areas. 
So we found um, that tuberculosis infection increased um, depending on the diabetes status of the participant. So you can see in the middle column there, uh, non-diabetics had 4.1% prevalence of infection, pre-diabetics 5.5, and diabetics 7.6%. And so this increased as um, diabetes increased. And so um, after not adjusting for any variables, diabetics had around two times the risk um, or the odds of tuberculosis infection compared to non-diabetics. And this, um, excuse me, this relationship uh, persisted um, after adjusting for other potential variables that um, were talked about, for example, smoking, um, for example, exposure, um, being foreign born, um, these kind of characteristics. After adjusting for these characteristics, diabetics still had 1.5 times the odds of having tuberculosis infection. So they were more likely. So we also wanted to see if um, diabetes severity or control of diabetes also affected this relationship. Um, and so we used a, a few variables um, that are established. So um, we looked at undiagnosed diabetes as one potential marker for um, diabetes severity uh, because by definition these diabetics are not on uh, medication and um, some studies have shown that these types of diabetics um, can sometimes have severe disease. And so we found that undiagnosed diabetics um, had 2.2 times um, the odds of tuberculosis infection compared to non-diabetics. And you can see that on the top, top rows. Um, and that diagnosed diabetics had similar rates of tuberculosis infection. So this suggests that undiagnosed diabetics um, may be the cause of of this increase in risk for tuberculosis infection. And so potentially um, one, area, one area that I think many people agree in, um, in tuberculosis control and diabetic control is that there needs to be a, a real push to try to um, diagnose diabetics that are, there's many undiagnosed diabetics globally. And so um, methods to try to diagnose them um, are definitely needed. Um, we also found that current insulin use, or not currently using insulin, excuse me, um, was um, these diabetics were at increased risk for tuberculosis infection. Um, and we also found that um, those with a fasting plasma glucose test above um, 130 milligrams per deciliter were also at increased risk for tuberculosis infection. And, and these diabetics were 2.6 times the, the odds of tuberculosis infection compared to non-diabetics. And so this, this is a, a marker that is um, usually used to diagnose diabetes, but also um, this cutoff point of 130 milligrams per deciliter is sometimes used to measure severity. So diabetics um, don't have as much, uh, that are above 130 may not have as much um, control of their diabetes, and so um, their glucose um, increases. And so this uh, marker also suggests that they that those that have increased um, glucose levels will um, have increased um, odds of tuberculosis infection. And so we also looked at um, the three variables, um, diagnostic tests. We looked at them continuously. So for every 1% um, um, of HbA1c, we looked at if that increased tuberculosis infection. And we did the same thing for fasting plasma glucose and two-hour plasma glucose. And we found that all three, um, after adjusting for other variables, all three predicted tuberculosis infection. So as each one increased, there was an increased odds of tuberculosis infection for each one. So in all, the, these, are, um, these results are suggestive that there may be an association between diabetes severity, so those that are having um, increased diabetes severity, and tuberculosis infection as well. So our results suggest diabetics may be at increased risk for tuberculosis infection, and this increases, uh, and there may be a dose response 
between non-diabetics, pre-diabetics, and diabetics. And so as you in increase on that spectrum, you may be at increased um, risk for tuberculosis infection. And we also, um, our results suggest that diabetic control may have some um, influence in this relationship. And those with poor diabetic control may be especially high, have especially high rates of tuberculosis infection. Um, it's important that this is a, it's important to note that this is a study in the U.S. And, and, and as I said, U.S. has very low tuberculosis burden. And so um, there needs to be other studies in, in areas where diabetes and tuberculosis are, are more common. Um, for example, China, India, Southeast Asia, um, areas of Sub-Saharan Africa where there's a lot of undiagnosed cases. Um, there needs to be further studies on tuberculosis infection and diabetes. Uh, these are just some collaborators um, that helped on the study. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Leonardo Martinez for sharing your invaluable research into your study. Diabetes increasing risk of latent TB is alarming news for all of us as diabetes burden is high in our countries along with very high TB. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to learn more. Well, let's bring in Dr. Anil Kapoor, Chairman of Board of Directors of World Diabetes Foundation. How diabetes with active TB disease and public health impact is over to you, Dr. Anil Kapoor. Good afternoon. Uh, let me. Good afternoon. Let, can you can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so I I thought about uh, initially that I would not uh, make any uh, slide presentation and I would just follow up on what Dr. Leonardo talked about and its significance, but I'll make a combination of it. Uh, so first of all, good afternoon from Bangalore, India. Uh, uh, what Dr. Leonardo uh, presented is very interesting uh, because of uh, several reasons. Number one, this was a study done in the US where the rates of tuberculosis in the background population are extremely low. Uh, but the rates of diabetes are high. And from a developed world perspective where tuberculosis has been almost eliminated in many of the Western countries, uh, this is very ominous because what it drives is that in settings where with very low endemicity of tuberculosis, patients with diabetes are at extremely high risk of acquiring tuberculosis infection festering that infection and then perhaps getting on to developing active tuberculosis. And this might actually result in, in undoing some of the developments that have happened with regard to tuberculosis control in the Western world. Particularly because in today's world, a lot of people are traveling around. People with diabetes may be traveling around to other parts of the world and may acquire infection uh, elsewhere. Uh, and, and, and this has grave consequences uh, for the control of tuberculosis. But let me uh, focus a little bit on active tuberculosis. Uh, well, the association between diabetes and tuberculosis is not new. It has been known for many, many ages. Uh, actually, Dr. it was known to the ancient uh, physicians. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, uh, can I? Yes. Can I can I interrupt them for a moment? Dr. Sir, could you please share your full screen? Because some people may be using their mobile phones and may not be able to see very clearly. Can you okay. share your full screen? Yes. Thank you so okay. much. Yes. Okay. Yes. Fine. Yes. So yes. basically, uh, this uh, the, the, the combination of tuberculosis and diabetes has been known for ages. Uh, and, and for many years in the past, uh, it, it was considered quite ominous and, and before the 60s uh, and in the early 40s, uh, when both tuberculosis, uh, the treatment for tuberculosis and both for diabetes was not very uh, good and not easily available, then it was said that a person 
uh, with diabetes would either die of ketoacidosis and if he survived ketoacidosis would actually die of tuberculosis. And there used to be, uh, there used to be, sorry, somebody has exist, uh, yeah. And, and so uh, basically uh, uh, that was the situation in the past. But with the availability of uh, treatment modalities, this, 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 has, this has changed and changed particularly in the Western world where uh, good treatment for diabetes was available and tuberculosis has been almost eliminated. But in the last 30 years, what we found is that in countries where TB was endemic in the developing world, diabetes has started rising very rapidly and therefore we are seeing a mix of people exposed to both tuberculosis and having diabetes and this has great consequences. So if you look at the burden of diabetes globally, there are about 450 million people affected with, with diabetes and in addition to that there are about 330 odd million people with pre-diabetes and as we saw in Dr. Leonardo's presentation that even people with pre-diabetes uh, are at increased vulnerability of acquiring tuberculous infection. So we're talking of a population of about 700 million people who are highly vulnerable to acquire tuberculous infection. And many of them are living in countries which, where tuberculosis is quite endemic. As you can see in this screen, that 80% of people with diabetes live in low and middle income countries and almost 95% of tuberculosis burden is also in those countries. Now why why does diabetes increase the risk of tuberculosis? And it's basically, we talk about a lot of uh, issues about, about diabetes. We talk about diabetic retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, etc. But we have failed to focus for a very long time on the issue of diabetic immunopathy. Basically, hyperglycemia causes a derangement of the immune system in the body. Uh, it, it causes an upregulation of the immune system. But this upregulated immune system has a lowered efficacy. So the response to the infectious agent is very brisk, but the ability to control the invading organisms is impaired. So actually, in fact, the macrophages, which are the defense against invading organisms, may provide a safe haven for the ingested mycobacteria because the ability to produce uh, the reactive oxygen species which, which helps kill the invading organism is, is quite hampered. So what this results is, is in a heightened chronic pro-inflammatory state that contributes to tissue injury, uh, causes dysregulation of immune responses, and actually worsens, because of this pro-inflammatory state, it actually worsens uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and, and worsens the control of diabetes. So it's not just a one-way traffic, it's not that diabetes increases the risk of tuberculosis, but getting tuberculosis actually worsens uh, the a body's ability to deal with diabetes and may actually worsen diabetes control. There are other common risk factors like tobacco smoking and alcohol consumption, and now there are similar socioeconomic determinants that are happening. So if you look at where is diabetes being hit the most, and you'd see that it is today in the urban slums of the megapolises. And this is also where tuberculosis lurks around. And therefore, the chance of these two conditions coming close together is extremely high, and, and therefore, it is extremely ominous. And as I said, theoretically, the association may be reversed in the sense that the presence of tuberculous infection and the pro-inflammatory state may worsen people with diabetes, people, worsen people who are at risk of diabetes. For example, people who are stunted have, have low uh, pancreatic mass and low ability to produce insulin. Uh, they, they, are, they are not the classical people at risk for diabetes. But these people, because of the high insulin resistance, may actually go into a state of diabetes. And, and this may worsen tuberculosis and, and the cycle continues. So what is the evidence we have so far? The evidence we have clearly is that diabetes increases the risk of active TB, latent TB as we just heard from Dr. Leonardo, and also the risk of MDR TB. Uh, and, and this is directly related to worsening of glucose control. And what Dr. Leonardo showed that even at fasting blood glucose levels of 130, uh, 
which is which is not uh, extremely bad diabetes control. It is bad, but it's not extremely bad diabetes control. We're finding an extremely high rate of latent TB infection. There are lots of people with diabetes that are undiagnosed. There are lots of people with pre-diabetes who don't know their status, and they are roaming around uh, all over. Uh, uh, and, and therefore they are at increased risk of acquiring infection and this infection then becoming into active TB disease. Uh, the prevalence rate of active TB in people with diabetes varies with the background TB incidence. Uh, in high TB burden countries it can vary between 5 to 14 times higher than in the general population. Uh, we, we did a study in Indonesia where the rates of of tuberculosis in people with diabetes was 14.7 times higher than in the general population. In India, it is in the range of about seven to eight times. And this is a situation that you see across the globe wherever you do studies like that. The prevalence of diabetes among TB cases is about two to three times higher than in the general population. And a lot of these people are get diagnosed for the first time when they are tested for diabetes with active TB infection. Now many people say that when, when you control TB infection, their, their diabetes status improves and, and many of them may become normal glycemic. So should we label them diabetic? In my opinion, if, if, they, if, they are, uh, if the blood sugars are sufficiently high for a diagnosis of diabetes to be made, uh, they are diabetic even when the blood sugar levels get controlled because when people with diabetes get controlled with treatment, we don't suddenly start calling them non-diabetic anymore. So this is a, a misconception that needs to be addressed that uh, because you have treated tuberculosis and the blood sugar levels have now come down, uh, that they are not diabetic. Even when they, when they get controlled without any active TB treatment, uh, active diabetes treatment, they are at high vulnerability of future diabetes uh, later on. Uh, and therefore, they should not be allowed to go scot-free without monitoring their diabetic status uh, and ensuring that they get uh, good care. Similarly, diabetes increases the risk of adverse TB treatment outcomes in terms of delayed sputum conversion. So they continue to, to spread infection. They have higher relapse rates. They have higher death rate during active TB. And recently, we are also learning that they have high risk of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. In, in a multi-country, and not only is it at individual level, but if you look at uh, from a population level basis also, you see that uh, in, in populations where diabetes has increased, the rates of tuberculosis are increasing quite rapidly. Uh, for example, in India, uh, we've seen that the growing prevalence of diabetes in India has increased the annual number of cases uh, in people with diabetes by 46% between 1998 and 2008. In Mexico, for example, the rates of pulmonary tuberculosis in people with diabetes increased by 83% in contrast to pulmonary tuberculosis cases in people without diabetes. And while a lot of attention is paid to, to the, the links between HIV and tuberculosis, and it's not about one disease against the other, but what I'd like to point out is that from a population perspective point of view, there are about 46 to 50 million people with HIV, but there are about 700 million people with either diabetes or pre-diabetes. And even though the risk of tuberculosis in people with diabetes may be not as high as with HIV AIDS, given the size and mass of the population with diabetes, diabetes today, according to me, is in the number one risk factor for, for growth of tuberculosis. And therefore, I like to say that the NTD strategy may not work until and unless we start focusing attention on diabetes. A modeling study uh, has actually shown that uh, if, the, if the rates of diabetes are not controlled, then we might actually see a global increase in, in tuberculosis instead of ending uh, TB. Uh, we are aware of the WHO Union uh, collaborative framework that the World Diabetes Foundation actually helped uh, evolve and, and, and supported very extensively over many years. Uh, and, and this has now uh, led to uh, other issues. Uh, 
we have been also very active in terms of promoting and advocating for the cause of uh, the linkages between diabetes and TB in terms of creating advocacy documents and uh, uh, we had this Bali declaration which was done in uh, I think it was November 2015 where the global community said that both diabetes and tuberculosis need to be addressed uh, uh, from a public health point of view if we are to control uh, both the conditions. The consequence of all these actions has been, has been quite good. Uh, for example, in India, we already have a bidirectional screening as part of the national policy. A lot of uh, documents have been created. The national framework for joint TB and diabetes in its is in place, the training manuals available, etc., etc. Well, it is good that all these policy documents are in place, but we have a long way to go to actually get them implemented at the grassroots level. So this is one of the issues that we need to address in many countries around the world. Similarly, in China, uh, the efforts the Union and World Diabetes Foundation did actually led to a lot of attention on this, but so far there has not been a policy document on on, on the bidirectional screening for diabetes and TB in China. Uh, the the Pan-American Health Organization uh, has done a wonderful work where now diabetes TB is now part of the PAHO chronic care passport which focuses attention on chronic NCDs and, and, and screening people with diabetes for tuberculosis is now an integral part of the uh, programs for chronic disease control in, in countries in Latin America. Uh, in Mexico, we heard uh, Dr. Martin Castellanos uh, speaking at the conference in, in, in Mexico, where he said that bidirectional screening is already being rolled out in Mexico, and TB patients are tested for diabetes, and people with diabetes are being tested for TB. And if you look at the risk in Mexico, for example, and, and the situation in India is perhaps even worse, uh, Indonesia is perhaps even even greater than India and many of these countries we are seeing that uh, one out of every three people with, with tuberculosis has diabetes, often undiagnosed and, and the rates of tuberculosis in people with diabetes are extremely high. So Indonesia has also uh, launched a massive uh, program uh, which is supported uh, by, by USAID and the Ministry of Health and the World Diabetes Foundation has also been supporting in, in getting uh, the training of, of several uh, you know, workers uh, in the field to actually implement bidirectional screening. Uh, similarly, a country like Tanzania has also uh, initiated bidirectional screening as a national policy. I, I believe that this is also being done in Bangladesh. Uh, and, and, and very interestingly, the Research Society for Study of Diabetes in India uh, with, in its meeting in early November will actually release a document which is a guideline on the joint uh, tuberculosis diabetes initiative uh, and it is, it is quite, quite interesting that the diabetes world is now waking up to this issue. From my perspective, I think it is very important because people with diabetes visit uh, the clinical settings very often. Therefore, they are also at increased vulnerability of acquiring infections. So infection control in diabetes clinics becomes extremely relevant. Otherwise, we will see people with diabetes acquire infection in a, in a, in a clinic and, and then go on to get active tuberculosis. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, from the TB perspective, I think it's very important that people uh, addressing tuberculosis are aware of the situation that every TB patient needs to be screened for diabetes and if found to be so must be actively treated and advised. So to summarize the converging epidemics of diabetes and tuberculosis is, is becoming quite ominous uh, and if you look at the countries where both the blue and the orange uh, uh, spheres are meeting these are countries that, that are actually at the nerve center of, of this exploding epidemic. Uh, and, and to say that diabetes increases the risk of TB two to threefold, diabetes increases risk of adverse TB treatment outcome in terms of delayed sputum conversion, higher relapse rates, higher death rates, 
drug-drug interactions uh, make it very difficult to treat both the conditions. Uh, similarly, giving nutritional and, and lifestyle advice to people with a double burden becomes extremely difficult. And there needs to be a huge effort in terms of creating awareness and in terms of building capacity to be able to address this. As a sideline, I, I always talk with, with colleagues in the diabetes world that we need to learn from the DOTS approach uh, which has been successful in addressing tuberculosis. We need to adopt the DOTS approach in, in trying to provide care for diabetes uh, because uh, the problem today is that diabetes treatment is very unstructured, there is no record keeping uh, and, and it is quite ad hoc. And in the public health systems in, in many developing countries, diabetes treatment is not available and, and therefore we need to address this in, 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 a, in a very systematic manner. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, for, for giving me this opportunity to talk on, on, on this important subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Uh, I think there is some technical problem at uh, Ashok Ramsarup's end. So I would continue. The global perspective from you was indeed important to set the stage to learn more from Professor Dr. Surikant, who comes from India, a top high burden country for diabetes as well as tuberculosis and drug resistant tuberculosis and tobacco use. Dr. Surikant recently got elected as National President of Indian Chess Society and he is professor and head of respiratory medicine department at King George's Medical University or KGMU. Welcome again to CNS webinars, Dr. Surikant as a key expert. Over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Sh uh, Shobha Shukladi for organizing this wonderful uh, disposition and interaction and uh, nexus I can say between tobacco, tuberculosis, diabetes and some other uh, factors. So if you see the problem of uh, smoking throughout the world, a very famous George Bernard show, he was of the opinion, what is cigarette? A cigarette is a roll of paper that has a fire at one end and a fool at the other. So this is my request to all smokers, 1.1 billion smokers in the world, that please go ahead these, this quote of George Bernard Shaw, and think over it whether you are doing a good job or a bad job. And if you see the tuberculosis about tuberculosis, the somebody written like this, some, whether we ourselves have escaped from the scourge of tuberculosis or not, there is probably hardly a family in India which has not had to do something with the judge's disease. And these words are not from a doctor, these words from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, our first Prime Minister of India, just after the death of Kamala Nehru, yeah. Dr. Khan, can I interrupt her for a moment? Doctor, we cannot uh, oh, sure. see your screen. So will you please share your screen? If you're showing oh, some sure. slides. If you can just okay, share. Yes, uh, I'm showing some slides. No, okay, no, okay, we okay. can't see your slides because you have how not to, shared. How to, no, how to share the slide? There must be then op an option there to share your slide on your computer. Okay. Is the option let, let me give one minute. Yes. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. 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 Yes. So okay. But so you I'm can making, make. Uh, yes. 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 Fine. Okay. Yes, you can see. Okay. Okay. Yes. Just see this first slide from my side. This is the quote from George Bernard Shaw that this is about the smokers, that a smoke, cigarette is a roll of paper that has fire at one end and a fool at the other. So this is my humble request to 1.1 billion smokers throughout the world, that please think over it, that what are you doing, you are doing a wonderful job or doing a bad job. Regarding the tuberculosis, these are the lines that whether we ourselves have escaped from the scourge of tuberculosis or not in India, but there is a hardly, probably hardly a family which has not to do something with this dreaded disease. And these were the lines wrote by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, 
because his wife Kamala Nehru died of tuberculosis in 1948 and at that time no effective treatment was available in this country. So it's a global problem both diabetes and uh, you can we can see the data this is the latest data of the all forms of tuberculosis like 10.4 million HIV associated 1.2 million and MDR TB like 4 lakh 80 thousand uh, people per year. And similarly, the smoking is also a common problem. Smoking is common in 22 countries characterized by WHO as high TB burden countries. So the country which are high burden TB countries, they are also having a high prevalence of smoking. That's a major link. This shows that both share some kind of association. They account for more than 80% of the TB cases worldwide. So uh, these are the 22 countries which are high burden in terms of uh, so India is a high burden TB country as well as the, for the smoking also. And a study was conducted to study the effect of smoking on TB recurrence. And this shows that the smoking is more than, of more than 10 cigarettes per day was significantly associated with TB recurrence. So even second time tuberculosis is significantly associated with the smoking. And uh, another study found that adverse effort effect of smoking on pulmonary immunity contributed to increased incidence of active and latent TB. So basically as we smoke, this smoke goes inside the lung and this decreases the lung immunity and that's why make lungs more vulnerable for not only latent TB but for active tuberculosis also. And a study which compared the smoking and TB treatment outcomes found that poor treatment. So it's not only the prevalence of TB which is high in the smokers but the outcome also poor so there's a poor treatment outcome that was 70% greater in smoker as compared to never smokers and patient who had stopped smoking they are having a lower risk of poor treatment outcome than those with uh, continued smoking. And in King George Medical uh, University we have done a study on the link between this is called a case control study of tobacco smoking and tuberculosis in India. And we have published this in a study in Annals of Thoracic Medicine in 2009. And still it is very relevant this study in which uh, it was found that the odds ratio of the association between tobacco smoking and pulmonary tuberculosis was 3.8. This means the smokers are having 3.8 times more vulnerability for developing tuberculosis in comparison to the non-smokers. So this is the Indian study, I think one of the rarest study which we have done in King George Medical University, Lucknow, India, that shows a clear-cut association with 3.8 odds ratio. And uh, a lot of have been uh, discussed by Dr. Kapoor for diabetes, linkage of diabetes. And uh, I would discuss the brief about the, what is the two uh, aspects, the first aspect is the impact of diabetes on tuberculosis and second aspect is impact of tuberculosis on diabetes. So impact of diabetes on tuberculosis if we see this occurs on latent TB also, the active disease also and diabetes increases risk for progression from latent TB to active TB. So all those for example in India about 40% population is having latent TB. So that's a if 40% this population they develop diabetes they are at the verge of risk, high risk for developing active tuberculosis. So if you see diabetes as a risk factor, so diabetes itself is a risk factor for so many infections and the important is tuberculosis you can see it is in red color that around 20% more prevalence of risk factor as diabetes and other infections also that like UTI and other infection but the tuberculosis is roughly around 20%. And if you see the frequency of TB patients occur with an increased frequency in diabetes and increased frequency is due to reactivation of old focus in comparison to the fresh contact. So latent TB, old heel TB, old focus, they are converting into the, uh, they are getting reactivated. So that's a very important aspect that they are usually not getting fresh infection, but the old infection get converted into the active tuberculosis. And so diabetes is an independent risk factor for developing lower respiratory infection as well as the tuberculosis. And a lot of factors, although we have discussed so many factors, other speakers, I would summarize that probable regions, the hyperglycemia favors growth, viability, and propagation of TB baseline. That's a very important factor that the hyperglycemia uh, 
reduction in antioxidant defense mechanism and increased thickening of alveolar capillary and arterial walls they are the other factors for making the lung as a local risk factor increased susceptibility of tuberculosis and so uh, some are certain other immunological factors also uh, that uh, they are related with the host defense mechanism like abnormal chemotaxis sudden phagocytosis and microbial function of polymorphonuclear cells decrease peripheral monocytes with impaired phagocytosis decrease c3 opsonin function in caducate cell mediated immunity so sputum conversion that's also delayed uh, we had the thought will really relapse the cells will be in this case the relapse also get delayed with diabetes have relapse more often with resistant stem that is also significant that the resistant population is not sensitive now it is the resistant one now and drug resistance also a little bit higher regions unknown but what is the second aspect that impact of tuberculosis on diabetes that effect of the patient with tb have a higher prevalence of diabetes mellitus so retrospective i mean contrary to the belief the there is a higher prevalence of diabetes in tuberculosis and a study have shown that even prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance test in patient with tb most tb patient have malnutrition and low body mass index and malnutrition has been postulated as a moderate modulatory factor in the pathogenesis of diabetes and drug drug interaction that's also important for the treatment management part and diabetes is risk factor for hepatotoxicity also with drugs and immune suppressive effect of diabetes so uh, according to who now diabetes versus the clinical course of tuberculosis and tuberculosis versus the glycolysis control of and that's why we published a article very famous article in indian journal that is diabetes mellitus with pulmonary tuberculosis a double trouble and that's a very famous Uh, article for uh, gp forum that is general physicians so we have to educate the general physicians of the country the globe uh, regarding this link of diabetes and tuberculosis and luckily this article published in the journal of Inter uh, indian medical association so indian medical association roughly having membership of around 3 lakhs doctors in this country and this uh, article was published in the journal of ima indian medical association and this was a very good uh, linkage article between diabetes and tuberculosis which is popular article in the forum of gp and this shows article uh, reveal that is screening for diabetes in persons with active so every person with diabetes tuberculosis over the age of 18 should be screened for diabetes mellitus in terms of hp a1c more than or equal to 6.5% fasting plasma glucose more than or equal to 126 mg per cent Two hour plasma glucose more than 200, and random plasma glucose also more than 200, with symptoms of hyperglycemia. And abnormal glucose value should be verified with a repeat test if person has no symptoms of diabetes. In conclusion, on this nexus, I would say that tuberculosis, smoking, and diabetes are the major health problems in our country and globally also. And according to the Global Adult Tobacco survey gets in India 34.6 percent of adult population are active tobacco users, and over 1.1 billion world population are tobacco smokers. So these are the persons who are at uh, increased risk of tuberculosis. Uncontrolled diabetes mellitus adversely affect the overall treatment outcomes for persons with active TB, and not only the increased susceptibility for tuberculosis. For optimal TB outcome, diabetes must be controlled. So that's why we should not focus only the anti-tuber treatment we should also focus on the smooth control of sugar levels and persons with tb who smoke require careful counseling for tobacco cessation along with appropriate at and that's why it is recommended now for example in king george medical university we have uh, dot center also the uh, 
for the treatment of tuberculosis and we have tobacco cessation clinic also. So all chest clinics, they should have the DOT center, the treatment center of tuberculosis as well as the tobacco cessation clinic. Active smoking adversely affects the overall treatment outcomes for persons with active TB and increases the risk of recurrence after successful treatment completion. Referral, close coordination and care management is essential to assure the cure. Tuberculosis treatment remains the same as in smokers or non-smokers or diabetics or non-diabetics. So thank you very much for this wonderful interaction on smoking, diabetes and tuberculosis. Thank you. Thank you for the CNS for organizing this wonderful interaction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Surikan, for a very an excellent presentation. This brings us to the end of experts' presentations, and we will now begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Open session begins now. We have a question uh, from Zafar from Star Paper from Dhaka. And the question is for Dr. Martinez. Uh, Zafar says that Dr. Martinez, your study participants came from USA only. Now, active and latent TB both are huge in our countries, countries like Bangladesh, India, and others. To what extent the study outcomes are applicable to high burden TB and diabetes nations like ours? And are you planning to expand your study to developing nations in Africa and Asia? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I think, um, as you said, the tuberculosis burden is very different in the U.S. compared to um, other countries in Asia and Africa. And so I, I think these, it's not directly applicable. Um, and, and it's more um, hypothesis driving and more pushing for additional research that is needed in those settings because you, you, potentially uh, research findings in the U.S. could be completely distinct from research findings um, in other settings with high tuberculosis burden, um, such as such as where you're from or, or, or other places. Um, so this these results really need to be um, confirmed again and um, in different settings. Um, and so we, we don't have any um, plans to to um, redo this um, anywhere else. This type of study. I know a couple other groups that are doing very similar work um, in South Africa and also in India. Um, and so hopefully um, they come out with results soon and we can, we can discuss that again um, in a forum like this, which was great. Uh, if if uh, Shobhaji, if I may yes. be allowed to yes. interview. Yes, please. I was about to ask you, Dr. Kapoor. Yeah, so the thing is that uh, this study that uh, Dr. Leonardo presented has great relevance for the developed world because their tuberculosis has been literally eliminated. And what it is showing is that if we don't control diabetes, we will have a population that is at high risk of acquiring tuberculosis infection. And this may have consequences for tuberculosis control in these countries over a long period of time. In countries like Bangladesh, India, and Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, where tuberculosis is endemic, all of us, uh, a large percentage of our population is already exposed to the tuberculosis organ, uh, organism. And therefore, uh, the issue of latent TB uh, is of less relevance. The relevance there is that in case you are from a high income setting, uh, with, with diabetes where you have not been exposed to tuberculosis, but you go to a diabetes clinic where there are other people who might have tuberculosis that has not been diagnosed. Therefore, you might have the chance of acquiring an infection. Uh, similarly, if, if, if uh, there is somebody working in your environment uh, uh, where, uh, where uh, they have tuberculosis, a person with diabetes who has not been exposed to it is extremely vulnerable. So it is in that context, it is of relevance, but the relevance of, of latent tuberculosis in, in countries like ours where tuberculosis is so endemic is of limited value. Uh, 
what is important is to understand that not only does diabetes worsen active TB disease, but diabetes also increases the risk of acquiring TB infection. Not only diabetes, but people with pre-diabetes also are at increased risk, and that is extremely ominous. Thank you. Uh, Ganesh Acharya wants to ask a question. Ganesh, would you like to ask the question? Hello. Yeah, I'm Ganesh here from India. Yeah. So, like uh, for prevention for the TB, even for drug resistance in India, like a high burden. So, diabetes, like uh, there is no integration of TB with insulin. Like uh, diabetes, also we have like uh, high burden diabetes. Ganesh, Ganesh, can I interrupt? There's a lot of noise coming from your uh, end. Can you put your voice on? Meanwhile, Nimer Ortun Guterres wants to ask a question from Dr. Martinez. Nimer, would you like to ask? Nimer wants to know what is the definition of pre diabetes? We have all the diabetes experts here today with us. What is the definition of pre diabetes? Would anybody like to answer that? Yeah, I can, I can do that, uh, yes. Shobhaji. Yes. yes, please. So, pre diabetes is a condition where the blood sugar levels are not high enough for a person to be diagnosed as, as diabetes. So we diagnose diabetes when the fasting blood sugars are above 126 milligram deciliter, uh, or if the two hour glucose, post glucose blood sugars are above 200 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, now, we define pre-diabetes as a state where the fasting blood sugars are in the range between 110 and 126 milligram deciliter, and this is the plasma glucose value. Okay, so if below 110, people are considered to be having normal glycemia. If the fasting blood sugar is between 110 and 125 milligram deciliter uh, plasma glucose, it is considered as impaired fasting glucose. This is also pre-diabetes or if you take a 75 gram glucose challenge test and if the plasma glucose value after two hours is more than 140 but less than 200. So between 140 and 199 it is considered as impaired glucose tolerance and both these conditions impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance are considered as pre diabetes why they're called as pre-diabetes? Because at this stage, people don't have diabetes, but their chance of getting diabetes uh, within few years is, is, is significantly higher. Uh, and therefore, what we say that if we want to prevent diabetes from happening, then if we can identify people with pre-diabetes, and if we can ensure that they start living a, a good lifestyle, they, they can, they might be able to delay the onset of diabetes or actually prevent diabetes from happening. Thank you. Uh, now, Ganesh wants to know that diabetes has always been ignored in India at policy level and the situation is very unclear. Uh, should TB be, should uh, all uh, TB, uh, all di people with diabetes be tested for tuberculosis? Uh, what, what is the way forward? Dr. Surikant, would you like to say yes. something? Yes, yes, yes. Tobaji, uh, it is true now, both ways, that if the person is more than 18 years of age and is having tuberculosis, he must be screened for diabetes. And if the person has developed diabetes, he must be screened for tuberculosis. So it has become a now uh, protocol that all diabetics, they should be screened for tuberculosis. And all tuberculosis patients, if the age is 18 plus, 
they should be screened for diabetes. So he's hundred percent right. This has become now protocol. Okay, uh, Dr. Surekan, there is another question for you from a Delhi-based uh, journalist, Mahesh. Uh, he Shubhaji, wants to know. Can, yeah. Yes, Shubhaji, yes, can I interrupt? Yes, yes, please do. Uh, please in do. In regard to Ganesh's question, while while that is a policy, the issue is the implementation of that policy. Yes. They right, are miles see. away from actually getting that policy implemented and therefore it needs a lot of effort and advocacy and I would request all journalists who are part of this uh, meeting to actually start writing about this issue because not only is diabetes a big risk for tuberculosis, diabetes is a big risk of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and death in people with tuberculosis uh, while they are on treatment and and we need to focus a lot of attention to ensure that at primary care level we have treatment available for diabetes. We, if we don't do it, we will actually negate the gains that we have had in tuberculosis control in the next five years, we'll be actually worse off than we were 10 years back. Mm -hmm. Shivani, I think he's 100%, sorry, he's 100% correct. Because even the GPs are not aware of this protocol, so I think the media has got a fantastic role to play that they should uh, propagate this uh, linkage as well as the interaction and of course the screening of diabetes for tuberculosis and the screening of tuberculosis for diabetes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sarma wants to ask a question. Who, who is the lead organizer of, uh, organizer of NatCon 2017. Dr. Sarma, would you like to ask your question? Okay, meanwhile, there is another question for Dr. Surikant. Uh, yes, Surikant. Yeah, yes, Dr. Sarma, please go ahead. Yes. Sir, Dr. Surikant, when, uh, I wish to know the pre diabetes and latent yeah, diabetes Dr. are the Sharma, same. First, any difference is there? Dr. Sharma, first of all, first of all, congratulations to you for organizing next NECCON at uh, Raj, You are welcome, uh, sir. You are one of our faculty. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Sharma, please ask. So pre-diabetes and latent diabetes are the same or different, sir? No, 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 no. Actually, okay. uh, uh, first stage is the latent diabetes, oh. where the insulin resistance started. The second stage is the expression of uh, increasing blood sugar level, as uh, sir had mentioned, that from 110 to uh, 126. So that is the second oh. stage, the pre-diabetic. And of course, uh -huh. the third stage is the diabetic. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, to clarify, we don't use the term latent diabetes anymore. Okay. All of us have latent diabetes. All of us, if we live up to 90 years, will go on to develop diabetes. Okay. Uh, so we have stopped using the term latent diabetes uh, anymore now. We only use the terms pre-diabetes and, and, and diabetes. Thanks for that clarification. We have run beyond our one hour, but questions are pouring in. So please stay online for a few more minutes and we will try to take in as many more questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar wants to ask, uh, he says that another issue which I have found in India that latent TB infection in India remains quite unidentified. Is that not a big issue? And will it not prevent us from reaching the NTB goal? unless we deal with latent TB infection also. Uh, Shobhaji, he is 100% right. Because in India, around 40% Indian population is said to be having latent tuberculosis. And due to malnutrition, due to smoking, due to diabetes, and due to stress, all these factors, they are basically producing, converting these latent diabetes into the active diabetes. So if you are just ignoring the 40% population of the India, it's a major chunk. If you think of the uh, uh, 130 crore population of the India, so 40% is roughly 50 crores. So you cannot ignore the 50% probable, I would say, patient of tuberculosis in future because some of them, they, may, they are a smoker and they are also at risk. Some of them, they are developing diabetes in future, so they are also at increased risk. 
some and of course due to this competitive life they are developing they are undergoing under stress so they are not also at, at risk so of course we have to made it uh, of course uh, the awareness programs the policy just to protect these latent tb patient converting into the active disease there is another question on similar lines uh, which says that latent tb uh, the pool of latent tb is huge diabetes is also huge and the number of people with undiagnosed tuberculosis and diabetes both is alarming will data of study similar study as uh, dr martinez has done will data in high burden nations be more shocking and what is what are the public health recommendations for diabetes progression and tb progression ipt is poorly rolled out for latent tb in so many high burden tb high burden nations including india so what are the public health recommendations what the panelists like to answer that please uh let me answer first shobha ji okay okay uh if you see regarding the problem of latent tb because i am a basically chest physician i'm not a diabetologist but my interest is in the field of diabetes and tuberculosis so i would say that as uh, it is mentioned that we are having a lot of patients of pre diabetes also and latent tb also so i think uh, the this population this population is basically at the verge of increase i mean latent t, uh, this uh, uh, pre diabetics they are the at the verge of developing t, developing uh, diabetes also and they are at the verge of developing tuberculosis also so from the very beginning of stage of the pre diabetics they should be screened for tuberculosis number one and they should be screened whether they are having latent tb and if they are having latent tb they are they are more at more increased risk of the developing active tuberculosis the second aspect is that those who are person who are having latent tb and now their blood sugars are altered or gtt is altered or they are under in whether diabetic category or pre diabetic category they should be properly monitored that they should not convert from the latent tb to the active tb and i think the very important aspect of diet which you are forgetting if you see the poor diet actually causes malnutrition and which malnutrition is the increased risk factor for tuberculosis and of course affluent diet rather i can say that fast food and the rich diet the modern kind of diet i would say that's increases the diabetes so i think the indian thali needs the rather global diet should also be a very important risk factor diet should also be very important public health consideration which we are ignoring in modern system of medicine if you see we have to look into the diet and nutrition in a very perfect manner along with lifestyle reducing stress by yoga and of course meditation because uh, the world has uh, forgotten the practice of yoga and meditation so stress is also because stress is a risk factor for converting latent diabetes into active diabetes also the stress is a risk factor for converting uh pre diabetics into the or insulin resistance into pre diabetics pre diabetics into the uh, diabetics so i think the we need a lot of policy measure the public health policy measure in terms of lifestyle changes in terms of implementation of yoga and meditation programs in public life and of course the, the correct diet habit diet habits that is the focus on nutrition proper nutrition that should be focused in terms of public health life uh shobha ji may I, uh, yes please yes please uh the the issue is is very relevant uh, because uh, both can worsen each other so pre diabetes can worsen latent tb and convert into active tb and this can then worsen the diabetes state so it can it it is a very complex relationship and it needs to be addressed but in a setting like india where we have multiple problems in the health system where we cannot even treat people with active tuberculosis where we cannot provide treatment for people with known diabetes to recommend any measures as a public health policy to start screening people for latent tb and to start screening people for pre diabetes
uh, is a little tricky. Uh, if if uh, if we had all the resources in the world to do it, I would I would say yes, we need to do it. But I think we need to find mechanism on how we can address it. This is something that needs to be uh, popularized, that people should become aware of. And in this context, I want to bring in another of my favorite issues, and that is uh, the linkages of uh, these things to maternal health. Pregnancy is a very big risk factor for tuberculosis. Pregnancy in India today is also becoming a very big risk factor for gestational diabetes and for programming of future generations. We need to pay a lot more focus on the health of the mother. We need to ensure that every mother is screened for latent TB uh, and, 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 and appropriate measures are to be taken because the mothers do provide the, the basis of uh, our microbiome in the body and, and, and if we have women who have tuberculosis uh, who are uh, having hyperglycemia and pregnancy and undiagnosed, I can guarantee you that child is very likely to go on to get diabetes and is also very likely to have tuberculosis later on in life. Uh, I think we need to find policies uh, to address some of these public health issues. Uh, it is clearly a very, very big and very important issue because tuberculosis and diabetes are today two very important public health problems and we need to find solutions. So the issue about latent diabetes and, and pre-diabetes is important. Uh, it needs more acknowledgement and, and no more research and, and public health measures what can be done. Uh, but uh, I would shy away from making a, a recommendation that everybody should be tested for it in, in a country where we cannot even provide basic health care. Thank you. Uh, I think we have already overshot the time. Uh, there is a good comment from Ganesh Acharya. He says, we are trying to push prevention of latent TB among PLHIV. Took eight years to scale up in the national level policy, still IPT is not implemented fully and there is a huge gap. In Mumbai, there are 50,000 people living with HIV, but only 500 people put on IPT. I was treated twice for PTB and EPTB in my life, but very late. Long time to understand the latent term as TB in India. Then. I would like to close with a comment from Roger Paul Kamugasha from Uganda, who is editor of the Health Times Africa. Rob, Roger says, we are yet to end an era of the decades long myth of drawing a line between tuberculosis and diabetes. Diabetes had long been regarded a disease of the well to do, while TB has always been defined as a disease of poverty. Until time came to realize that TB as an airborne disease has no borders and it's silent, it is silently killing people in the developed as well as developing world. This link between an infectious and a non-communicable disease will no doubt shift the paradigm in achieving set targets for each of them. This link of latent TB to diabetes should come up in the first ever UN high-level meeting on TB next year. Strong advocacy by civil society on TB diabetes integration will be applauded. Something that brings the rich and the poor together for a common cause, to me, is a plus in terms of awareness creation. With this, I would like to close the webinar, although still questions are pouring in. So would the panelists like to give some last minute comment before we finally close? A any, any specific comments from the panelists? Shobhaji, I think the last comment from Uganda is, is actually very remarkable. Um, and, and basically, from my perspective, this study about latent TB and diabetes uh, in the US is actually providing that link that people in the developed world are no longer safe uh, until and unless they start addressing the issue of the links between diabetes and tuberculosis. And this is very important from a developmental perspective because in the past, money for uh, issues related to NCDs 
were considered to be not very relevant from a developmental perspective. It was not something that a person with diabetes in, in India would impact the health of somebody in the United States. But a person's health with diabetes and latent TB has got a relevance to people in the United States now because this infection can, can go across uh, and, and will, will impact and, and therefore addressing diabetes and tuberculosis uh, becomes very relevant. So I think that comment is, 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 is very nice. It actually eliminates the divide between the rich and the poor. But only thing I would like to say is diabetes today is no longer a disease of affluence, it is actually a disease of poverty. Right, you're very rightly said. Uh, Dr. Martinez, would you like to make some brief comment? Yeah, um, I just want to say um, uh, basically support what the other two panelists have been saying that very much uh, I think a comprehensive approach is definitely needed. Uh, for these two diseases because especially in in Asia and Africa where where both diseases are so prevalent and so um, just this this uh, this forum was great just to to, to uh, push that that topic and and, and just uh, not just infection control not just diagnosing but a whole comprehensive intervention is definitely needed to, to target um, these two diseases Thank you. Dr. Surekant, a brief parting comment from you. Uh, I think considering the very important two diseases, one is communicable, second is non-communicable, that is the problem of global, uh, I can say globally. So I think we need uh, a lot of media involvement, public movement, uh, social leaders, the political leaders and religious leaders to come together to fight these uh, double trouble diabetes and tuberculosis. Thank you. We now come to the end of this webinar. My heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists and participants for taking part and enriching it, this webinar with their valuable inputs. Special thanks to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease for helping us host this webinar. The webinar recording will be made available to all of you as always. And lest we forget, World Diabetes Day is on the 14th of November. Let us all pledge to follow a healthy lifestyle, to remain free of diabetes and tobacco use, to reduce the risk of other related comorbidities. Goodbye and have a healthy day.